Thank you, Marianne. Um, I'm delighted to be here, although one of, one of the highlights for me is coming to see Gary Tab. So, I mean, I think you should see this as the appetizer, maybe mainly, mainly uh, appetizer before the main course. Um, okay, so, you know, is sugar the new tobacco? And the actual original title of my talk is whether sugar, whether we should be advocating um, policies on sugar, is it, is it just about the science, how much activism needs to be involved to highlight these this issue, this major public health crisis that we're facing. So just to start, just to put things in perspective, you know, this is a global problem, but you know, in the UK, we have a massive public health crisis with obesity. Two thirds of adults in the UK are now overweight or obese, and one in three children, perhaps more disturbingly, by the time they leave primary school, by the age of 11, are also in the same category. It's costing the NHS about six billion pounds per year, and this is set to increase significantly by 2050 if we fail to act. I think very few people can deny the fact that the root cause or the major root cause behind the obesity epidemic is the processed food environment. These foods have become unavoidable everywhere you go. It's very difficult to avoid foods that are energy dense, high in sugar, they're processed, whether it's you know, even in gyms, the hardware store, you know, on the high street, everywhere you go. For me, however, and this is where my cam campaign started as a, as a clinician, as a cardiologist working, is what I find the biggest scandal is that we've even allowed our hospitals to become a branding opportunity for the junk food industry. How did we allow this to happen? One of the hospitals in London, just to give you an example about the impact of this, um, you know, has several thousand visitors walking through the corridor every week. And in that corridor, there is a Smith's, which when I grew up as a, as a child, actually that was something that you'd go to to get stationery or magazines, and basically now it looks like a candy store. And, you know, this, is, this legitimizes the acceptability of, of junk food. Um, there's a very good study done in the United States looked at pediat pediatric institutions that had the sale of junk food on site, and in fact, if you visited that hospital, or those hospitals, you were four times more likely to purchase junk food when you left the hospital than if you hadn't even entered the hospital in the first place. So there is a subliminal message that legitimizes the consumption of these foods. Even bed-bound patients, you know, people I treat with heart attacks, they come in, they usually have to be bed-bound for 24 hours, so they can't even go to the shop to buy the junk food. It's brought to them on a trolley. There are contracts with hospitals, and I've been on ward rounds where I've been speaking to a patient about improving their diet, and they're being given sugary drinks. They think it's acceptable, obviously. If the hospital's serving them the sugary drinks, it must be fine. And this is the other issue. You know, this is a problem that affects everybody because of the food environment. The fact that 50% of the National Health Service's 1.4 million employees are now overweight or obese is a clear example that education is ineffective when the food environment is working against you. I think a lot of us here also realize some of that education has been flawed and wrong, but we'll come on to that later. And again, this perpetuates the revolving door of healthcare. So one of the leading researchers on um, behavior um, in terms of the, the environment and food is Teresa Marto in Cambridge, and she says in an article she wrote in the British Medical Journal that food choices are often automatic and made without full conscious awareness. So despite wishing to lose weight, we're still tempted to buy that brightly colored chocolate bar at the checkout till in the supermarket. The food industry know where to place their products, so people are gonna increase the, the consumption, the sales of those foods. And again, it's made worse by the aggressive marketing of the junk food industry, and they target children the most vulnerable. In the United States, fast food Advertising, processed food advertising, um, the food industry spends about $4.2 billion a year. I mean, that's a lot of money they spend on it. And just to put things in perspective, for every one pound the World Health Organization spends in trying to promote or prevent diet-related diseases, the food industry spends 500 pounds in marketing junk food. That's the balance of power. That's what we're up against. And this is how we've got to this problem in the first place. And of course, this is important because it also contributes to pester power, especially for parents. They find it difficult. I'm sure many of you here um, are parents, have got young children, and it's very difficult you know, when, the child, when a child is pestering you because of advertising and junk food advertising and um, to, to sort of deny your kids um, those foods. And I think parents find it very difficult. 
So let's put it, let's just take a look at the bigger picture here now. So, you know, when we look at the Lancet Global Burden of Disease reports, poor diet now contributes to more disease and death than physical inactivity, smoking, and alcohol combined. So this is an important slide because we're talking about a population problem, therefore the solutions will have to be population-based. And this is, uh, uh, the, this is Tom Frieden's Health Impact Pyramid, Centers of Disease Control. And if you see here, the, you know, changing the context, making the healthy choice the easy choice is going to have a much bigger impact than counseling or education. Of course this is important, but this is going to have it. That, that means regulatory approaches, government in, uh, intervention. We've seen it with tobacco. We've seen it whether it's with fluoridization of water, trans fat regulations. This is going to have the biggest impact on population health. And these policy-based interventions tend to be more effective because they reach all parts of the population and they're not dependent on sustained individual response. Okay, sugar. Why should we pick on poor old sugar? In 1972, a British nutritionist John Yudkin published a book called Pure White and Deadly. And he believed that at that stage that sugar was the enemy number one. This was the main dietary driving factor behind heart disease. But John Yudkin was hung out to dry. His message was not welcomed by the sugar and processed food industries. And they used various methods to impede his work. Um, he writes about this in Pure White and Deadly. They interfered with his research, funding, and publication. Around the same time, an American scientist known as Ansel Keys, he actually suggested that saturated fat was the main cause of cardiovascular disease. And he engaged in rancorous language and personal smears and attacks to dismiss the evidence that sugar was a problem. And it's interesting, I only learned this relative recent, relatively recently, but some of Ansel Keys' research was actually funded by the sugar industry, which is very interesting. But the food industry ultimately discredited the case against sugar, and they won that PR battle decades ago. We didn't hear very much after that. Yudkin died in 1995, and his warnings were no longer taken seriously until this man comes along, Robert Lustig, pediatric endocrinologist, University of California, San Francisco. And he writes a commentary in Nature um, about sugar. He gives a talk on YouTube. I'm sure many of you have seen it. It's got over 5 million views now, saying that sugar is a major issue. And this was a few years ago. And things then, people started to look more critically at the data. So is it time for action on sugar? Well, the first thing to say, and I think this is really important, I've been saying this a lot recently, um, is that the, you know, sugar, added sugar, actually doesn't, there's no nutritional value whatsoever. The body doesn't require any carbohydrates. So it's not, it's not a nutrient. It doesn't provide you with any benefit. You don't need added sugar at all. There's no biological requirement. It's something we can do without. And then over the last few years, we've seen very good observational studies and some small randomized control trials with sugary drinks that have clearly linked um, excess sugar consumption with weight gain and obesity. Something else that we shouldn't forget is that, you know, this is the, the number one culprit driving um, tooth decay. So it's one of the only few things that we ingest that directly corrodes teeth enamel. And this is important. In the UK, the commonest cause of chronic pain in children is tooth decay. And the commonest cause of hospital admissions in children is tooth decay. And the single driving factor behind that is sugar. To small amounts, um, you start to get um, an impact, a negative impact on teeth. Again, this is just to emphasize the fact there is no nutritional value whatsoever. It's not required. We do not need it. Now, let's talk a little bit about fructose. So when we talk about added sugar, we specifically mean sucrose or high fructose corn syrup. For those of you who don't understand that, basically, um, essentially the same thing. Sucrose is 50% glucose and 50% fructose, and high fructose corn syrup is 55% fructose and 45% glucose. But the common wisdom is that a calorie is a calorie and sugar is just empty calories. As I've said, it's something we don't require. But actually, there's very good data to suggest that chronic fructose exposure uh, promotes liver fat accumulation and then metabolic syndrome. And this is important because the metabolic syndrome is any three of the five of high blood pressure, impaired glucose tolerance or type 2 diabetes, dysglycemia, in other words, increased triglycerides in the bloodstream, decreased HDL cholesterol, and increased waist circumference. And this is important because now about 66%, two-thirds of people who are admitted to hospital with a heart attack with myocardial infarction actually fulfill criteria of having metabolic syndrome. And if you have the metabolic syndrome, compared to somebody who doesn't have it with a heart attack, you're 50% more likely to either be readmitted to hospital or die within a year of admission. 
and I haven't put this on this slide, but what, the other aspect to all of this, this is quite interesting, is about 75% of people admitted to hospital with a heart attack actually have normal cholesterol levels. So there's another interesting discussion about cholesterol in all of this as well. Have we focused on the wrong thing? I think we have. So this is a slightly crude slide, but it's taken from um, Robert Lustig's Nature paper. And this, I think this is really where the focus should be, is actually the problem is not so much obesity. Obesity is an issue, but it's actually what precedes obesity. It's a metabolic syndrome. And we know about up to 40% of people who actually harbor the same metabolic abnormalities as people with obesity, whether it's high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, fatty liver disease, actually have a normal body mass index. So metabolic syndrome is the, is the problem, is the issue, which basically means we're all vulnerable. You know, you, people have the illusion of protection. If they have a normal weight, then they're going to be okay. But actually, in my view, that, that doesn't, a normal weight doesn't exist. I don't think there's any such thing as a normal weight, as a healthy weight. There's only a healthy person. And the evidence actually supports that. So what's the fiction? So what Coca-Cola say, they say beating obesity will take action from all of us based upon one simple common sense fact. All calories count, no matter where they come from, including Coca-Cola calories and everything else. What does the science tell us? Well, the, the science tells us that all calories are not the same. You know, uh, fiber, protein, fat, fructose are all metabolized differently by the body. I don't think anybody, when they think about it, clearly would believe that all calories act in the same way and where, where they come from, what foods they come from. And this is a really nice quote taken from the chair of the National Obesity Forum, who's a good friend of mine, David Haslam, and he wrote this, um, he was quoted in an article I wrote in The Guardian in 2013. Uh, and I'm just going to read it out because I think it's very important because I think a lot of this calorie theory, um, I think, is just complete unscientific nonsense the way that we normally perceive it and understand it. So it's extremely naive of the public and the medical profession to imagine that a calorie of bread a calorie of meat, and a calorie of alcohol are all dealt in the same way by the amazingly complex systems of the body. The assumption has been made that increased fat in the bloodstream is caused by increased saturated fat in the diet, whereas modern scientific evidence is proving that refined carbohydrates and sugar in particular are actually the culprits. And, you know, just to explain that briefly, actually what happens is when you have starch, sugar, and alcohol um, the, in excess, then what happens is the liver will endogenously produce fatty acids that are saturated fatty acids that are actually much more strongly implicated with type 2 diabetes and heart disease. And we've forgotten that. Whereas dietary saturated fat, actually, the, um, the evidence is telling us certainly if it comes from dairy products, it's very likely to be protective and certainly not harmful. Um, just a slide here to summarize a, a major study on sugary drinks from the Epic Interact study. And that basically showed in, across Europe that if you consumed one sugary drink per day, that was a strongly associated of increasing the risk of type 2 diabetes by about 29%. But what was interesting about this study is that increase in risk was independent of body weight. It was even in non-obese people. Again, this is not about obesity. I think one of the best studies that has been done in terms of, we were talking about a population, uh, a food environment problem. So this is a study, an econometric analysis carried out by Stanford University researchers Sanjay Basu and Robert Lustig. And what they did is they looked at um, 175 countries worldwide and looked at what could be driving the increased prevalence of type 2 diabetes over a number of years in the food environment. And what they found was for every excess 150 calories of sugar one consumed, typical of a can of cola, compared to calories from another source, whether it be fat or protein, there was an 11-fold increase in the prevalence of type 2 diabetes, independent of body mass index, and independent of physical activity. So that suggests even if you're doing lots of exercise and you're of normal weight and you consume too much sugar, you're still putting yourself at risk. What did the American Heart Association say in 2009? Well, actually, they were concerned about the fact that, you know, based upon nutritional surveys, and they tend to underestimate the, the amount of sugar we're consuming in general, um, the average American was consuming about 22 teaspoons of sugar a day. And they came up with a recommendation in 2009 saying that we should consume no more than nine teaspoons for the average male, adult male, and no more than six teaspoons of added sugar as a limit for females. But there's a reason I'm mentioning this, and it's going to come up. So even now, what's really quite, I find quite extraordinary, is if, you know, the food industry talk about personal responsibility and, and giving people information, the information's available. Um, but if you look at labeling in the UK, and the same across Europe, for sugar, what the recommendations for sugar on the labeling of foods is, this is obviously a can of color. Now, many of you will know this has about eight and a half teaspoons of just pure 
added or liquid sugar in it. But the labeling actually suggests still, if you look at the labeling, and sorry, it's a bit blurred, but this actually, this can here, it says this represents 39% of your guideline daily amount. They've put all sugars together, so even sugars that you get, glucose from vegetables, for example, they've, they've conflated them together. In, a, in essence, that would suggest to a consumer you can have two and a half, you should have, not you can, you should have two and a half cans of Coke a day as part of your healthy, balanced diet. So in 2003, the World Health Organization, concerned about the sugar issue, actually suggested that added sugar should be no more than 10% of energy. And intrinsic sugars should be about 10%, which comes from whole fruit and vegetables. But as I said earlier, the labeling in the UK and across Europe actually conflates those two together and gives a very misleading message, saying that, in effect, you can be consuming 22 teaspoons of sugar a day. Now, in the United States, and this is very interesting, when I went over there, I was doing a kind of a report stroke investigation for the BMJ, which I'll come on to in a second. Um, what was interesting is um, they actually don't consider sugar as a nutrient. There's no RDI, reference dietary intake. So for Amer Americans, they don't actually have any uh, labeling, uh, certainly then, that t would tell people how much they should consume or give a percentage. And therefore, it's extremely difficult for consumers to actually know how much sugar is added to the foods. And this is important because actually in the United States, and it's, no, it's not dissimilar in the UK, about a third of sugar consumption comes from sugary drinks. A sixth comes from foods that people normally associate with being junk food, ice creams, candy bars, biscuits. But almost half of sugar consumption comes from non-junk foods, from hidden sugars, if you like, from foods that are like low-fat yogurts or what people may perceive as being healthy. And Around that time as well, um, what, what happened was, because of this issue that was highlighted in the American Heart Association paper, the um, US Department of Agriculture actually initially put a, on their website, they put, um, for consumers to understand how much sugar was being put in ketchup, for example, they put some uh, information up there for the consumers. And then it got removed. It got removed because the food industry weren't very happy with it. Um, and they gave this statement saying, no method can analyze for added sugar, so their amounts must be extrapolated or supplied by the food companies, many of which are not willing to make public such proprietary information. So what else did the food industry do that hinder progress for public health? We call it the corporate playbook of big food. In fact, Kelly Brownell, professor of public health in the States at Duke, actually has written a very good paper on this. Um, and these are some of the arguments that I'm sure a lot of you have heard and you'll continue to hear but it's important that we talk about this and get this out there. So they talk about personal responsibility. So we're all overweight or obese, or majority of the population are overweight or obese because we're irresponsible, basically. It's our fault. And they raise fears that government intervention or action will interfere with personal freedom. But we've got to remember, when we think about the greatest public health successes that have taken pl pay place in the last you know, century or so, they've happened from government intervention, whether it's safe drinking water, seat belts in cars, uh, smoke-free buildings. And this is what's actually had the biggest impact on population health. In fact, if you look at the increase in life expectancy in the UK from 1900 to 2000, there's been an average increase in life expectancy of about 30 years. 25 of those 30 years are because of public health interventions, not personal responsibility. And just to, the other thing they also engage is corporate social responsibility. So when the city of Philadelphia was thinking of introducing a sugary drinks tax, um, one of the junk food industries actually gave a 10 million dollar donation to, that to the hospital, to the, one of the local hospitals, children's hospital. Sugary drinks tax didn't happen. And they also vilify critics. Um, you know, many, some of us here, myself, Tim, you know, we've been uh, you know, attacked in the media and behind the scenes and, you know, from, from these vested interests, and they may call us food fascists, the food police, leaders of the nanny state. They also criticize studies that hurt industry as junk science. So what else do they do? This is one of my bugbears. They emphasize physical activity over diet. But actually, if you look at the data, uh, and I published an editorial with Tim Noakes in the British Journal of Sports Medicine last year, which got a lot of attention uh, globally, um, is the fact that actually physical activity levels haven't really changed that much in the last 30 years as obesity has rocketed. That's not to suggest physical activity isn't good for you. Um, you know, I think you know, Tim actually gives a great quote, which says, you know, the benefits of exercise are unbelievable. But if you have to exercise to keep your weight down, then your diet is wrong. And actually, that says a lot. And you know, this is part of the problem. They've associated junk food with sport. And um, actually, you know, physical activity has lots of benefits, but certainly weight loss is not one of them. And uh, a lot of us have believed, I used to believe this, that the, the way to combat obesity is to do more exercise. But it's simply not true, especially if you're not eating the right foods. 
And what, you know, how similar is this to what tobacco did? So it took 50 years from when the first links between smoking and lung cancer were published in the British Medical Journal before any effective regulation. And that's because the tobacco industry engaged in dirty tricks. We call them dirty tricks. Their corporate playbook was to deny that there was any evidence linking smoking and lung cancer, planting doubt, obviously, confusing the public, and even buy, buying the loyalty of scientists. Anything to protect their only interest, which is profit. And just to show you a level of that denialism, in 1994, the CEOs of every major tobacco firm went in front of US Congress and swore under oath they did not believe nicotine was addictive or smoking caused lung cancer. That's a level of denialism, ladies and gentlemen. And we see the same thing happen, happening with the junk food industry and with the sugar industry. What else do they do? Well, they associate junk food with sport. In 2012, we had the Olympics in London. I did a report for BBC News now, based, Newsnight, basically saying one of the current affairs programs, saying that you know, I found it obscene that in the middle of an obesity epidemic, the major sponsors of the Olympic Games were actually companies such as McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Heineken, you know, these are companies that basically the consumption of, excess consumption of their foods are strongly associated and linked with obesity. They shouldn't really be um, sponsoring these events and we shouldn't allow them to. Picture speaks a thousand words. <laughs> so I put all this together in a commentary in May 2013 in the British Medical Journal, it was press released, and basically putting a lot of these arguments that I've just put to you now forward in this paper around the fact that we had a big problem around the information on sugar, um, a lot of evidence was linking sugar to chronic disease, and we need to do something about it. Um, it got press released by the BMJ, supportive quotes from Professor Terence Stevenson, who at that time was um, the chair of the Medical Royal Colleges. He's now the chair of the General Medical Council, and I've published some papers with him before. Professor Simon Capewell, who's the vice president of Faculty of Public Health, and Tim, who gave a very good quote. And uh, it got a lot of coverage, and it was picked up by BBC News. And I went on BBC Breakfast to speak about this um, and how that you know this is this is a real issue, and you know with a lot of concerns around public health because of excess sugar consumption. And uh, unfortunately, I was very disappointed because I was really up for a debate with members of the food industry. And at the end of the conversation with the presenters, Bill Turnbull said we should add that we did ask 10 different companies or organizations associated with carbonated beverages, supermarkets, sugar manufacturers to discuss this with Dr. Malhotra. All of them were unavailable. I was very disappointed. A few months later, I then published an editorial in the British, Medi uh, British Medical Journal saying saturated fat was not the major issue in cause of heart disease, and I'm sure you'll hear a little bit more about this later on, and sugar was, and again, that got a lot of, lot of attention. And shortly, just before then, I got contacted by Professor Graham McGregor, who's a professor of cardiovascular um, medicine at the Wolfson Institute in, in London, um, and he basically said, listen, we need to get a group of experts together. We should launch an organization called Action on Sugar, and um, you know, we need to do something about this, and I think this is a time. And, and, and we got together, and in January 2014, we launched Action on Sugar, a campaigning organization to highlight the harms of excess sugar and get sugar consumption down in the population. And we were really quite amazed with the response. I mean, it got, I'm sure a lot of you probably heard about this. It was front page of the Daily Mail newspaper. They took a quote from Simon Capel, called Sugar is a, sugar is a New Tobacco. And there was press coverage which went global. Um, it was all over the media in the UK, picked up by all the news channels, um, and we were very happy because you know, we had drawn attention to this. You know, in my view, one of the things I say when it's talking about you know, taking on vested interests or misinformation is that sunlight is one of the most powerful disinfectants, and certainly we, sh we shone a light on sugar at that stage. Um, then, a few days later, the empire struck back. Uh, Andrew Lansley, uh, former health minister, spoke in parliament. Just when we were, you know, we were very happy, everything was going really well. Uh, one of the Labour Party uh, um, uh, politicians, Keith Vaz, supported us, and Andrew Lanzi got up and he said, you know, this was ludicrous essentially to associate sugar to with tobacco. The analogy was inappropriate, and he said sugar is essential to food. But a few days later, in the Observer newspaper, I wrote an article on behalf of Action on Sugar, and I pointed out a few things. So, return of the health jedis, I would say. This is an article entitled, Sugar is now enemy number one in the Western diet. And part of what I wrote was, I said, he attempted, Andrew Lansley, to rubbish respected public health professor Simon Capewell's statement that sugar is a new tobacco. Lansley then compounded his errors by ignorantly asserting that to the House that sugar is essential to food. It is not. 
he would have been more accurate in saying sugar is essential to the to food industry profits and lining the pockets of its co-opted partners. Lanzi was a paid director of marketing company Prefera to the end of 2009. Prefera's clients have included Pepsi, Mars, Peter, and Diageo's Guinness. We didn't hear anything from Andrew Lanzi again. <laughs> and then the following week, we talked about buying loyalty of scientists. There was an exposure by Dispatch's investigative journalist, uh, journalism program. Um, and uh, the Daily Mail and Sunday Times basically linking the fact that m several members of our Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition had very strong research and personal financial links to uh, companies associated or linked to sugar, and that was suggested that that may be, may be biasing their view in terms of why have they been keeping quiet for so long um, on this sugar issue. Um, and uh, again, that got a lot of attention. And then Shortly after that, the Health Secretary, Secretary of State for Health, Jeremy Hunt, actually um, asked for a child obesity plan, and we, we got an, a meeting with him, and we put together a, a seven-point plan. I won't go into a lot of details, but essentially, you know, this was around how do we get sugar consumption down. Um, you know, one of the recommendations we suggest is getting the food industry to reduce the amount of sugar that's being added by 40% over the next few years, by 2020. Um, and limit availability of sugar, sugar drinks and junk food, and again, incentivize healthy, healthier food, and if, if this, these things aren't met, then we should have a sugar tax. Now, why are we here? Why are we having, even having this discussion? I think one of the problems is, uh, and, I've, and I said this publicly on Monday when, uh, as part of uh, the National Obesity Forum and a, a new organization called the Public Health Collaboration, which I'm a founding member of, uh, which got a lot of news attention, in the UK is that the current dietary guidelines are wrong. They've been wrong for a long time. We've wrongly demonized low fat. As a result, people are increasing their consumption of sugar and refined carbohydrates. And part of the problem with all of this is one, it's flawed science, but it's also being perpetuated um, by you know, organizations, unfortunately, I think, who are, who are supposed to be representing you know, what's best for public health and scientific integrity. But the real scandal, and I'm quoting a cardiologist who I know called Peter Wilmshurst when he talked at the Center of Evidence-Based Medicine in 2014. And this is specifically in reference to the pharmaceutical company. But you know, in my view, the same applies to the food industry. And the real scandal we have is not these companies, they're profit-making businesses. But the real scandal is the fact that doctors, institutions, and journals, that includes medical journals, that have responsibility to patients and scientific integrity collude with industry for financial gain. That is one of the major issues we're facing. This is one of the challenges we have. But we have to talk about it. It's not about finger pointing. This is all the product of a broken system. And once we talk about it, then we can start finding solutions to actually you know, prevent the harms on public from misinformation uh, and do our jobs properly and exercise real, true, transparent scientific integrity in, in, in terms of the information we're giving to the public. So just to, to round up, so some generic lessons. So tobacco control, we managed to achieve success in tobacco control by, ta by targeting what we call the three A's in public health, the affordability, the acceptability, and the availability. So that means ta taxes um, and increasing the price of, of, uh, of tobacco did reduce consumption. The same thing happens, will happen with sugar, I have no doubt. In fact, you know, we had a victory only um, a couple of months ago. We had the call from a relatively right-wing government, which was extraordinary, uh, calling for an introduction of a sugary drinks tax in 2018. So that was a, a real success, and we're very happy with that. Um, but other things need to be done as well. So, you know, banning uh, tobacco advertising, same thing should apply to junk food. Um, and also that will ultimately reduce the effective availability of these foods. And, you know, I think no one can deny, and I, I, I'm ha happy to have a discussion with anyone who would challenge this, that the food environment is a major, if not the major, root cause of this problem. So the same things will apply to sugar. It's something we can do without. You know, the difference between tobacco, a lot of similarities clearly between tobacco and sugar, but one of the differences is that tobacco industry didn't target kids. Tobacco industry didn't target children, but the sugar industry do. So we have a responsibility to our children, at the very least, to do something about this. And even Credit Suisse Investment Bank, they did their own analysis on all of this independently, taking information from very good studies and experts around the world. And even they have suggested, in conclusion, in a report they did on sugar, that um, we believe higher taxation on sugary food and drinks would be the best option to reduce sugar intake and help fund the fast-growing healthcare costs associated with diabetes and type 2 di uh, and, and, and obesity. So, what are the lessons? public health triumph, safe drinking water, sanitation, immunization, seat belts, tobacco advertising bans. All of these happened because of regulatory processes. So where are we right now? You know, the science isn't sufficient. The evidence emerges, the understanding spreads, professionals accept the paradigm, 
the public and politicians become aware and then supportive. Opposition from vested interests is slowly overcome. Regulation is introduced and often strengthened by taxation. And really, this is what people need to acknowledge. That we have the science. Obviously, remember what happened to John Yudkin. You know, that he, he actually, almost as a, a lone figure, they didn't have the science as strong as we do now um, in his time. He didn't have that, that much science, ev scientific evidence as strong as we do now. But, you know, on his own, unfortunately, he, he was silenced. And, you know, as a group, uh, as a group of people around the world who want to stand up for true scientific integrity, free from commercial interests, you know, if we unite together, then we can really make things, uh, we can really make progress on, on this issue, which is damaging people's health every single day and contributing to great suffering. So, you know, I think there's something positive here. Um, that people are discussing this now. We're getting this all out in the open. And I genuinely believe that we can make real progress on tackling the harms of excess sugar. Thank you very much.